Butte, Montana, January 13, 1901. I, of womankind and of 19 years, will now begin to set down as full and frank a portrayal as I am able of myself, Mary MacLean, for whom the world contains not a parallel. I am convinced of this, for I am odd. I am distinctly original, innately, and in development. I have in me a quite unusual intensity of life. I can feel. I have a marvelous capacity for misery and for happiness. I am broad-minded. I am a genius. I am a philosopher of my own good peripatetic school. I care neither for right nor for wrong. My conscience is nil. My brain is a conglomeration of aggressive versatility. I have reached a truly wonderful state of miserable, morbid unhappiness. I know myself, oh, very well. I have attained an egotism that is rare indeed. I have gone into the deep shadows. All this constitutes oddity. I find, therefore, that I am quite, quite odd. I have hunted for even the suggestion of a parallel among the several hundred persons that I call acquaintances. But in vain. There are people and people of varying depths and intricacies of character. But there is none to compare with me. The young ones of my own age, if I chance to give them but a glimpse of the real workings of my mind, can only stare at me in dazed stupidity, uncomprehending. And the old ones of forty and fifty, for forty and fifty are always old to nineteen, can but either stare also in stupidity, or else, their own narrowness asserting itself, smile their devilish smile of superiority, which they reserve indiscriminately for all foolish young things. The utter idiocy of forty and fifty at times. These, to be sure, are extreme instances. There are, among my young acquaintances, some who do not stare in stupidity. And yes, even at forty and fifty, there are some who understand some phases of my complicated character, though none to comprehend it in its entirety. But as I said, even the suggestion of a parallel is not to be found among them. I think at this moment, however, of two minds famous in the world of letters, between which and mine there are certain fine points of similarity. These are the minds of Lord Byron and of Marie Bashkirtseff. It is the Byron of Don Juan in whom I find suggestions of myself. In this sublime outpouring there are few to admire the character of Don Juan. But all must admire Byron. He is truly admirable. He uncovered and exposed his soul of mingled good and bad, as the terms are, for the world to gaze upon. He knew the human race, and he knew himself. As for that strange notable Marie Bashkirtseff, yes, I am rather like her in many points, as I've been told. But in most things, I go beyond her. Where she is deep, I am deeper. Where she is wonderful in her intensity, I am still more wonderful in my intensity. Where she had philosophy, I am a philosopher. Where she had astonishing vanity and conceit, I have yet more astonishing vanity and conceit. But she, forsooth, could paint good pictures. And I, what can I do? She had a beautiful face, and I am a plain-featured, insignificant little animal. She was surrounded by admiring, sympathetic friends, and I am alone. Alone, though there are people in people. She was a genius, and still more am I a genius. She suffered with the pain of a woman, young. I suffer with the pain of a woman, young and all alone. And so it is. Along some lines I have gotten to the edge of the world, a step more and I fall off. I do not take the step. I stand on the edge and I suffer. Nothing, oh, nothing on the earth can suffer like a woman young and all alone. Before proceeding farther with the portraying of Mary MacLean, I will write out some of her uninteresting history. I was born in 1881 at Winnipeg, in Canada. Whether Winnipeg will yet live to be proud of this fact is a matter for some conjecture and anxiety on my part. 
when I was four years old, I was taken with my family to a little town in western Minnesota, where I lived a more or less vapid and lonely life until I was ten. We came then to Montana, whereat the aforesaid life was continued. My father died when I was eight. Apart from feeding and clothing me comfortably and sending me to school, which is no more than was due me, and transmitting to me the McLean blood and character, I cannot see that he ever gave me a single thought. Certainly, he did not love me, for he was quite incapable of loving anyone but himself, and since nothing is of any moment in this world without the love of human beings for each other, it is a matter of supreme indifference to me whether my father, Jim McLean, of selfish memory, lived or died. He is nothing to me. There are with me still a mother, a sister, and two brothers. They also are nothing to me. They do not understand me any more than if I were some strange live curiosity, as which I dare say they regard me. I am peculiarly of the Maclean blood, which is Highland Scotch. My sister and brothers inherit the traits of their mother's family, which is of Scotch lowland descent. This alone makes no small degree of difference. Apart from this, the Macleans, these particular Macleans, are just a little bit different from every family in Canada, and from every other that I've known. It contains and has contained fanatics of many minds, religious, social, what not, and I am a true Maclean. There is absolutely no sympathy between my immediate family and me. There never can be. My mother, having been with me during the whole of my nineteen years, has an utterly distorted idea of my nature and its desires, if indeed she has any idea of it. When I think of the exquisite love and sympathy which might be between a mother and daughter, I feel myself defrauded of a beautiful thing rightfully mine, in a world where for me such things are pitiably few. It will always be so. My sister and brothers are not interested in me and my analyses and philosophy and my wants. Their own are strictly practical and material. The love and sympathy between human beings is to them, it seems, a thing only for people in books. In short, they are lowland Scotch, and I am a Maclean. And so, as I've said, I carried my uninteresting existence into Montana. The existence became less uninteresting, however, as my versatile mind began to develop and grow, and know the glittering things that are. But I realized, as the years were passing, that my own life was at best a vapid, negative thing. A thousand treasures that I wanted were lacking. I graduated from the high school with these things. A very good Latin, good French and Greek, indifferent geometry and other mathematics, a broad conception of history and literature, peripatetic philosophy that I acquired without any aid from the high school, genius of a kind that has always been with me, an empty heart that has taken on a certain wooden quality, an excellent strong young woman's body, a pitiably starved soul. With this equipment, I have gone my way through the last two years, but my life, though unsatisfying and warped, is no longer insipid. It is fraught with a poignant misery, the misery of nothingness. I have no particular thing to occupy me. I write every day. Writing is a necessity, like eating. I do a little housework, and on the whole I am rather fond of it, some parts of it. I dislike dusting chairs, but I have no aversion to scrubbing floors. Indeed, I have gained much of my strength and gracefulness of body from scrubbing the kitchen floor, to say nothing of some fine points of philosophy. It brings a certain energy to one's body and to one's brain. But mostly, I take walks far away in the open country. Butte and its immediate vicinity present as ugly an outlook as one could wish to see. It is so ugly indeed that it is near the perfection of ugliness and anything perfect or nearly so is not to be despised. I have reached some astonishing subtleties of conception, 
as I have walked for miles over the sand and barrenness among the little hills and gulches. Their utter desolateness is an inspiration to the long, long thoughts and to the nameless wanting. Every day I walk over the sand and barrenness. And so, then my daily life seems an ordinary life enough, and possibly, to an ordinary person, a comfortable life. That's as may be. To me it is an empty, damned weariness. I rise in the morning, eat three meals, and walk, and work a little, read a little, write, see some uninteresting people, go to bed. Next day I rise in the morning, eat three meals, and walk, and work a little, read a little, write, see some uninteresting people, go to bed. Again I rise in the morning, eat three meals, and walk, and work a little, read a little, write, see some uninteresting people, go to bed. Truly an exalted, soulful life. What it does for me, how it affects me, I am now trying to portray. January 14th I have in me the germs of intense life. If I could live, and if I could succeed in writing out my living, the world itself would feel the heavy intensity of it. I have the personality, the nature of a Napoleon, albeit a feminine translation. And therefore, I do not conquer. I do not even fight. I manage only to exist. Poor little Mary MacLean, what might you not be? What wonderful things might you not do? But held down, half buried, a seed fallen in barren ground, alone, uncomprehended, obscure. Poor little Mary MacLean. Weep, world, why don't you for poor little Mary MacLean? Had I been born a man, I would by now have made a deep impression of myself on the world, on some part of it. But I am a woman, and God, or the devil, or fate, or whosoever it was, has flayed me of the thick outer skin and thrown me out into the midst of life, has left me a lonely, damned thing filled with the red, red blood of ambition and desire, but afraid to be touched for there is no thick skin between my sensitive flesh and the world's fingers. But I want to be touched. Napoleon was a man, and though sensitive, his flesh was safely covered. But I am a woman, awakening, and upon awakening and looking about me, I would fain turn and go back to sleep. There is a pain that goes with these things when one is a woman, young, and all alone. I am filled with an ambition. I wish to give the world a naked portrayal of Mary MacLean. Her wooden heart, her good young woman's body, her mind, her soul. I wish to write, write, write. I wish to acquire that beautiful, benign, gentle, satisfying thing, fame. I want it. Oh, I want it. I wish to leave all my obscurity, my misery, my weary unhappiness behind me forever. I am deadly, deadly tired of my unhappiness. I wish this portrayal to be published and launched into that deep salt sea, the world. There are some there, surely, who will understand it and me. Can I be that thing which I am? Can I be possessed of a peculiar, rare genius? and yet drag out my life in obscurity in this uncouth, warped Montana town? It must be impossible. If I thought the world contained nothing more than that for me, oh, what should I do? Would I make an end of my dreary little life now? I fear I would. I am a philosopher, and a coward. And it were infinitely better to die now in the high-beating pulses of youth than to drag on year after year, year after year, and find oneself at last a stagnant old woman, spiritless, hopeless, with a declining body, a declining mind, and nothing to look back upon except the visions of things that might have been, and the weariness. I see the picture. I see it plainly. Oh, kind devil, deliver me from it. 
Surely there must be in a world of manifold beautiful things something among them for me. And always, while I am still young, there is that dim light, the future. But it is indeed a dim, dim light, and oft times there's a treachery in it. End of part one.